Psalms to be reading through as a congregation together every day at 9 o'clock, wherever you are and whenever 9 o'clock is for you, are listed in the bulletin, uh, Psalms 125 to 131. So read one each, uh, each, uh, each day. You get extra credit, of course, for having done all of 119 last week. Congratulations to all of you who succeeded in doing that. Um, I encourage the, uh, the young folks in the congregation to continue reading through the Psalms, one chapter of Psalms every, thank you, one chapter of Proverbs every, um, uh, every morning or, or evening, one chapter every day, so that you read through the book in the month and then uh, start again the next month. This is the, Drew, is this the, the third year or the second year that we've been doing this? The Proverbs? Yes. Proverbs, this is the second year. Second year? Okay. Seems like third. But if you haven't been doing it, that's okay. You can start now. You can pick it up because all the Proverbs are right there. So I encourage you to, uh, to do that. The Claysons have a prayer request in the bulletin, I encourage you to be praying for them. You'll notice that the one that's listed is prayer request number two. That means that there was a prayer request number one, and that you can surmise there may have and was a prayer request number three. But you only get in your bulletin prayer request number two. That should do two things for you. Number one, pray for these girls as they begin their their schooling here in Georgia. Um, uh, pray for them. This is a difficult time for them. They're off the field of Lebanon for a year. They'll be in American school for a year, and then they're going to be back over in, in Lebanon next year. So, Jordan? Thank you. Jordan. And uh, one Carolina is another Carolina. Um, Jordan. Uh, so please be praying for them. That's the first thing. Number two is figure out what number one and number three are. And if you can't do it on your own, you can ask me and I'll tell you how to figure it out. Um, the third thing about the, the Claysons is that uh, Matt will be with us for a missions emphasis week in September. Uh, is it the 8th, 9th? The 8th of September. So he'll be with us the 8th. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that his uh, kids will be and wife will be with him as well. So we're looking forward to, to having Matt and the family back with us. So be praying for them as they uh, continue in their, uh, in their home assignment here, here in, in the United States. We also have uh, an exciting time coming up with Alliance Women. If you come to our meeting in the morning, you'll find one through four for the Claysons because I've already printed it out and plan to bring it for us to pray for them. So please join us for that meeting. We have lots to do tomorrow. Lots to talk about a birthday card to sign for McKenna and get her check off to her and um, pray, of course, for our international workers. So please come. The directions are in the bulletin. And if you have any questions, give me a call. Thank you. A bulletin correction is the, the hymn number for We Will Glorify Your Bulletin is actually hymn number 211. And, uh, but, the, but that doesn't matter because the words are printed in your bulletin for you. So for that one song, uh, you'll, you'll have the, uh, uh, the words in the bulletin. <coughs> for the others, we'll use the hymn books that are in the Are there any other announcements? Um, choir, Colin? The notice has gone out. Okay. Any other announcements? Yes, ma'am. Um, so we are starting back up with our Friday nights for the fall in the student ministries. We're going to do um, an event the third Friday. It's going to be the 23rd. And then we're going to start back up on a regular Friday nights on the 30th. That's the last Friday of the month. Um, if you want to sign up for a meal, there will be a sign-up sheet um, that you can sign up for Friday, bring a meal, and the students will have a meal, and you can 
kids enjoy eating with them, so I'm going to sign up sheet for that. Um, from now through the end of the year. Um, and I think those are all my announcements for the fall for now. Thank you. Any other announcements? Uh, I am a firm believer in um, a comfortable environment for learning. And one of the, the major comforts in learning is uh, an established routine. Changing it somewhat today, hopefully with uh, with effect. So, um, if you're not familiar with with our uh, regular uh, liturgy, uh, you won't recognize it. But if you are, um, be let it disequilibrate you some. Let it set you a little uh, off so that you pay a heightened attention to it. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come in the midst of the context of this life that you have revealed to us uh, as good and yet infested with evil, is hopeful and yet uh, has so much hopelessness, is yours you are the God and the Lord of it, and yet there is an enemy that works against you. We come in the context of, of our own lives, and we come by your grace and mercy in the context of having been touched, enlivened, and filled with your Holy Spirit. We pray, O oh God, that you would move in our hearts this next hour. And lift us up, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord is calling us to himself. Psalm 106 is a, a particular psalm in the course of the organization of the psalm books. It, it ends one of the major sections. And it does so profoundly and robustly is often lost on us. Part of our scripture for the worship will be the very beginning of Psalm 106 and the very end of Psalm 106 as well. So be mindful of that whole context. Psalm 106, chapter 1, verse 1 says, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. This word, praise the Lord. In the, uh, in the Hebrew language, it's the two words. There's the word praise and there's the Lord. And it can be put together in many ways. And that's the... And that's the phrase that it starts here. We find this word mashed together in a particular place, in a singular place, are these two words mashed together in a particular place in the Bible. And we're very familiar with it. It only happens four times in all of the Bible. These, this phrase that we've been that literally means praise the Lord, is squeezed together only four times, and all in the same context. And all in the, in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation, and it's the, the, sort of the subject matter for, for the sermon today. And it's a word we all know. Only four times in the Bible. The word is hallelujah. I remember when our friend um, Thar, John Thar was here. And he taught us to, to speak African. Right? Do you remember what he told us to speak? Hallelujah. So how did it go? Well, the leader would say hallelujah and everybody would respond back. Is that right? 
Okay? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Not bad. Let's do it for John. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! That's good. Let's do it for Africa. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Now, let's do it for the Lord. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah! Right? It doesn't say, it doesn't say hallelujah because it's not the two words mashed together. Do you get what I'm saying? Or am I being obtuse enough to, to cloud everybody's understanding? But when you say, praise the Lord, you're saying, hallelujah. So, hallelujah, almighty king. Will you stand with me and sing, praise to the Lord, the almighty. Hymn number 49, 7, 47. Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. We have made it through chapters 16, 17, and 18. The downfall of the great harlot Babylon. We've made it through. 
Praise the Lord. And we come to what some of your subtitles in your translations will call the fourfold hallelujah. The fourfold hallelujah. In the bulletin it says the four hallelujahs. That, that sermon title is grossly uninspired. It's wrong. It's not four separate hallelujahs. It's one hallelujah. Because there's one Lord. And fourfold is a much more ex uh, inspired way of thinking about this. As we touched on in the Sunday school class. Because the point of the four hallelujahs is the four individual hallelujahs. But the point of the fourfold hallelujah is the person that is receiving the hallelujah. It's the cloth that the four folds are made out of. Do you see the difference? Do you, do you get the significance, the glory of the idea of the fourfold? It's not what's written on the cloth. Savior, sanctifier, healer, and coming king. They're glorious and wonderful and exciting, but the point is the cloth that they're written on. We, I'm glad for the banners, and I appreciate them, but they miss the point because they're two banners, and it should be one fold or one cloth with four folds. So that's the context that you've got to wrap your mind around. These fourfold, or this fourfold hallelujah. We'll see the first one is God's entire redemption. His redemptive will. His plan of action. The second one is God's vindication. His proving that He is right in your life. And the third is the amen of God's creation to him, the so be it, the total commitment to God. That's what he requires. He requires total commitment. And the fourth, uh, the fourth hallelujah is the hallelujah of the beloved for the beloved. It's the bride's Hallelujah. And we'll touch on that today, but we'll get to spend the next several weeks in exploring the bride of Christ. As I said a little earlier, hallelujah is a Hebrew compound word for praise, literally, and Yahweh. Yahweh is the personal name of God as revealed in Scripture. In most of our translations, in the Old Testament, Yahweh is translated Lord in capital letters, all caps. So when you see Lord in all caps, it's a translation of the Hebrew symbols for Yahweh. Thus we understand hallelujah to mean literally, in, in English, praise the Lord. That's much more simpler than what I tried to explain earlier, but that's it. So hallelujah means what? Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. After these things, what has happened? Well, everything from Revelation chapter 1 all the way up until Revelation chapter 19. So you've got to roll the the film, roll the, the, the information, the scroll, roll it through your mind and see all of the vision unfolding, all of the plagues, 
all of the seals broken, all of the cups poured out, all of the wrath, all of these things happening, all of the exaltation in, um, uh, in, uh, in heaven, the, the total and complete defeat of the unholy union between fallen humanity and Satan. Completely destroyed. Amen. So verse 1, after these things, John, who was in a vision, said he heard something like a loud sound of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. The watchers. The ones who are watching all of this unfold. The ones who, who groaned and cried and lamented in heaven because the whole universe was scoured to find someone that was worthy to open the scroll and no one was found worthy to break the seal. That means, that means the deed to history is lost, it's closed, it'll never be satisfied. And then the watchers see the lion lamb of Judah. Jesus is worthy. He's worthy to break the seal and to open the roll. This, these same watchers respond to all that they have seen from heaven. They've been watching the great unrolling of the scroll. It was sealed up and they didn't know what to expect. Now they see Babylon hurled into the sea not to rise again. The apostasy, that unholy union of mankind and Satan is over. Hallelujah! Anybody here got a problem with the world? Anybody here pressured by sin? Anybody here sick? Not physically, but sick spiritually because of what the enemy is doing to you? Gone. It's gone. It's gone like a millstone thrown into a great deep. It's not going to float back up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. This is in direct response to the command back in Revelation chapter 18, 12. Rejoice over her, the fallen Babylon, O heaven, and you holy ones, and the apostles and the prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against the great heart. And there is this great voice of a multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. The first. Hallelujah. The first. God's entire redemptive plan is unfolding. All this fall of Babylon, and I remind you that Babylon, this holy union between mankind and Satan, manifested in religion, which is your culture, whether you are, think of yourself as religious or not, it is your culture. Your religion and philosophy define your culture, and it is. So religion, government, and economy. The fall of Babylon reflects God's character. His glory, His power, His salvation. It comes directly out of who He is as a being. He identified himself as I am in English. I am that I am. So we have these three things that are highlighted. Salvation, glory, and power. Salvation belongs to God. That's what it says. Salvation belongs to our God. 
This is how Jesus was able to say, salvation is to know the Father. Salvation is not a commodity. It's not a thing that, that comes out. It's not a, a state of being. Salvation is part of the personality of Christ. Was Christ's death on the cross something outside of him? Was it just a way, a plan that they came up to satisfy whatever needed to be satisfied for redemption? It was the issue of who he is. Our salvation is not something that we receive. Our salvation is in someone we receive. Our salvation is in Jesus Christ. Salvation belongs to God. Glory, it says, glory belongs to God. Again, it is an issue of His character. It, as we've worked over these many years on a definition of glory, on a, on a deep understanding of it, we always have to come back to the ideas in English of value and worth. It's where it comes from. That God is the only ultimate value. It's difficult for me to use language like that because it sounds so commercial. But, but it gives the brilliant contrast between the merchants of the great harlot whose value is in their greed and luxury and the true worth, weight, value, the glory of God. That God is the only ultimate value. Power belongs to God. It is of His divine nature. He spoke the universe into being. You do yourself great disservice if you think that you're too well educated to believe that. He spoke the world, the universe, into being. He defeats all the evil powers. He breathes out life. All salvation, all glory, all power belong to God. The context here is God's dealing with evil and rebellion. The point is that it is in His nature in his being, in who he is, to deal properly with evil and rebellion. The answer to the question that was asked earlier in Revelation, how long, O oh Lord, how long, the answer is not very long. Not very long at all. It seems long to us. Because we have our eyes on the clock. It seems long to us because we don't have our eyes on the clock maker. Some of us have our eyes on our salvation. And as glorious as it is, we need to take off of our salvation and put them on our Savior. Some of us are so good and so holy and so clothed in white linen that we're focused on our sanctification. But we need to take our eyes off of our sanctification and put them on our sanctifier. Some of them are so ridden that we cry out for healing. But we need to take our eyes off of our healing and put them on our healer. 
you'll have to work out the fourth fold of our coming king for yourself. But I don't think you're going to have any trouble doing it. When Jesus shows up, I don't think anybody's going to be saying, what you got behind your back, Jesus? What you got in your pocket? You got a surprise for me? I think he's finally going to be enough. He was enough in this vision. The great watchers cry out in unison. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Verse 2 explains the context. Because his judgments, God's judgments, are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was, has, uh, who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. This is God's judgment on that unholy alliance between humanity and Satan. She has done harm to God's creation. And she has done harm to the ones trying to do good in God's creation. We saw it in the fifth seal of the martyrs before the throne crying out. And God responds to faith and to faithfulness. That God's response is this. Verse 2. He has avenged the blood of his bond servants. Avenged the blood. Language that we are a little squirmish with these days. The idea is vindication. Vindication. We don't use that word very, very much anymore. But the idea of vindication is proof proof that someone or something is right, is reasonable, or is justified. So, here's the point. The martyrs, though they were killed, are vindicated, proved to have been right. Now, if you, in this worldly context, take someone's life, you have proved that they're wrong. Because they're not standing up talking anymore. You've removed them. But the world is wrong. And God is right. That should get a hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, The martyrs are vindicated. You then are vindicated because you are in God. Right? You're born of His Spirit. And where He is, you are, and where you are, He is. Here's the point. You are vindicated. You are proved right. Because God is right. If you are of God, you are by nature right. If you are not of God, you are by nature not right. It doesn't matter what you do or don't do. You are by nature not right. But if you are born of the Spirit, you are in the vindication of God. Evil is not vindicated ever, but condemned because it is not of God. This produces
uses the second fold hallelujah. Verse 3. And the second time they, the great watchers, said hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. The second hallelujah. This is strong, strong language. Hallelujah is not just a repetition. It's not just what we say. It's not just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But it is an extension of the very praise of life for God. Her smoke rises up forever. This is the idea of eternal punishment. This is the picture that we have of eternal damnation. The smoke rises up forever. It isn't that on earth there is a place that still smolders and continues to burn. But it is that her punishment is forever. There never comes a time, ever, there never comes a time when the unholy alliance between Satan and humanity is acceptable. Ever. Never. There never comes a time when it's acceptable. Hallelujah! <laughs> Hallelujah! The martyrs are vindicated forever. Your faith in Jesus Christ is vindicated forever. So it really doesn't matter if your neighbor looks at you like you've got three heads when you tell them about Jesus. You're vindicated. So it really doesn't matter if you stumble or fall in your presentation of the gospel to someone. As long as you love Jesus and it comes out, you're vindicated. That's what's in this verse. Your faith and your faithfulness is vindicated. Some people would say rewarded. But it's vindicated. It's proven right. What you believe about Jesus is the truth. And the truth sets me free. How you live Christ out in your life is the truth. How you live Christ out in your life is the truth. Proved right against your enemies for all time. And how significant is that to you? Does it make any difference, or can you just fly under the radar forever and ever? Look at verse 4. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sits on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. The third hallelujah. The 24 elders and the four living creatures, we remember them from chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Remember what they're doing. They fell down and they worshipped God who sits on the throne. And here we see them falling down and worshipping God again from the 5th chapter until the 19th chapter. There's some continuity there. There's some beauty there. And what do they say? This time they say, Amen. Amen. We recognize amen to be the so be it. As you say, it is to be. Amen means so be it. Complete agreement with God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, soul, mind, and body. It's the only way. It's the only way. And that's what they're saying. So be it, they're saying. So be it to the salvation, the power, and the glory. So be it to the vindication. So be it to the redemptive plan that you have. So be it. Complete agreement with God in thought and in action. How many times are our words and our deeds out of line? 
How many times do we want to do the thing that we know we should do? And we end up doing the very thing that we don't want to do and know we shouldn't do. That ends as well in the great Amen. When you take Christ as your life and you die to self and you live to Christ only, Amen. So be it. Becomes your byword, your watchword, your motive. How much God must long to hear the so be it from his rebellious children. He created us to love us and to bless us and to draw us into his great excitement. And all we have to do is say, Thy will. So be it. Jesus wept over rebellious Jerusalem. He cried out in a loud voice, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and you will find rest for your souls. Oh, rest for your souls, mind, emotions, and will, body, soul, and spirit. Jesus ministering, vindicating, saving, sanctifying, healing every aspect of us. He pleaded with the religious types of his day. If you had known God, you would have known me. Jesus is standing among those he created to love. And he's loving them, even in their rebellion. The shout that he heard on the porch of Pilate was not Amen, Hallelujah. The shout that he heard as he stood around those he came to say, as loud as loud waters, the shout that he heard was, give us Barabbas. But in his sacrifice, in his creation, out of his own nature. A new humanity came. A new humanity. One born of the spirit, not of the flesh. One born from above, not from below. One born from the will of God, not the will of man. Look, look at this moment of the fourfold hallelujahs. In verses 1 through 3, we have the redeemed in heaven singing our hallelujah. Praise the Lord. In verse 4, we have the heavenly court, the 24 elders and the four uh, living creatures singing out hallelujah. Praise God. And now in verse 5 the fifth hallelujah. And now in verse 5 the church on earth is in to join in in the great hallelujah. Verse 5, And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small 
and the great. Hallelujah. The church, you, have been invited in to the great amen through faith in Jesus Christ, through death to self, through the filling of the Holy Spirit. And then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah! Finally! Finally from the church! Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Is that roaring in your bones this morning? If it's not, your bones are dry. And they're laying in a, in a valley somewhere, waiting for the Spirit of God to breathe on them. Let it be today. Why live as a dead thing when you can be alive in the living one? In the one who himself breathes life. The fourth hallelujah is waiting for your voice. For your life. For your so be it. What do we mean when we say praise the Lord? What do we mean by praise? Anyway, in English, it's not an old word. Middle English, about a thousand years, you go back and that's when you first start finding it. And it means of all things, praise means to set a price on. Here's that commercial thing again. To attach a value to something. What is this about this this commercial thing. To praise means to value something more than anything else. That's what we're saying when we say praise the Lord. We're saying, I value God more than anything else. Maybe what's so uncomfortable comfortable about that is that it's just a little too concrete. That we like to keep our spiritual stuff in that mystical world where we can never quite be held accountable for. But that's simply not what's going on. Can you come anywhere close to saying that you value God more than everything else? More than your money. Oh, that's too easy. You guys are gracious and generous givers. We do financially out of God's economy amazingly well. We're not rich by human means, but we are rich in God's eyes. That's what makes the difference. But money. More money? Yeah. Nah. We're, we're... Can we say that we value God more than our time? Now, we might be getting close to meddling. One hour a week? Okay, I'm going long. One hour and three minutes a week. That's, that's not even close. That's not even beginning. If this is the tip of the iceberg, no, we would see. If, if the hour is the iceberg, it's more like an ice cube.
Can you say that you love God more, you value God more than your family? Now I really am stepping on toes. But Jesus himself said when his mother and his brothers thought that maybe he had lost his mind and he was off preaching too much, talking to somebody too much in his own home, that they, they went over to quietly take him home. And he said, I'll tell you who my mother, my mother, and my brothers and my sisters are. Those who are hungry for the word of God. Are you more in love with God than you are with your own family? You're countercultural if you are. Now this one, you don't stand a chance. Can you actually say that you value God more than yourself? Who do you work for anyway? Do you work for God or do you work for yourself? building your life around or coming to the table. And you know that in the, in, the, in the idea, in the essence of the word to remember him in the elements means to build your life around him. To remember, not in recall to mind, but remember as in that this is what your life is based on. This is the cornerstone. This is the foundation that he is your life because you died and are resurrected in Him. Are you building your life around Jesus or yourself? Maybe it's easier to think that the redeemed in heaven value God above all else. And that they can say hallelujah with a clean conscience. Maybe it's easier to think that the heavenly court, the 24 elders and the four living creatures, value God above all else. And that they can say hallelujah. But the vindicated truth is that the true church on earth values God above itself. That's the truth. Amen. Hallelujah. That for the bride to be worthy of the groom. Do you hear the word worth? She must value him more than herself. More than everything else. We all have work to do with God in this moment. As we come to this table, let his Holy Spirit work a new work in you. Don't try to make yourself holy. Let him work in you. Let him be your savior. Let him be your vindicator. Let him be the glory and the power. Let his divine amen be stamped on you. Let His Holy Spirit have sway in your heart. Will the musicians come forward? Don't watch us. This is just smoke and mirrors. You're focused on the Holy Spirit, God filling you to overflowing in this moment. This is your time.
Let's stand together and sing hymn number 134. Hallelujah! What a Savior.
great sound of the watchers in heaven, of the bride on earth, the great, the great Calvary. He died so that you could live, so that you would never be alone, so that you would never be without his Holy Spirit. His holy, think about that. His holy spirit. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone who opens to me, I will come into him. Will it be you today? himself, maybe for salvation, maybe for sanctification, maybe for healing, maybe for the great so be it of I am, maybe whatever. But will you receive the Spirit of God today? He came a long way to give it to you. Will you believe today? Will you ask
you stand with me and sing the chorus. We will go on.
certain things. He has gotten rid of sex traffickers and drug dealers. They're gone. We have a new, a new enemy in our midst. And I know that God is mindful and watchful, and he will protect us. I am praying for the peace of our neighborhood, that God's peace will rest and to settle these disgruntled people. But now we, it's thought that there's children involved in this. So we have to pray for our, our children who are coming up in a, in a time when God is not in their realm of Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that encourages us and strengthens us and enlightens us. And we thank you that you have in Christ put your word in our hearts. And so we pray that you would manifest yourself in, the, in, in your uh, power and result would be that we would love you, love you more fully, and that in loving you we would love our neighbors and we would impact them for your kingdom, for your honor and glory. We pray, Father, for all of our neighborhoods and our culture and this world. And we ask, Father, spirit to change hearts and minds and lives. We pray for protection. We pray for revival. But in all things, Lord, we pray that your will would be done and that you would be glorified. And we thank you. We pray for our governors institutions, our uh, men of, of commerce, all of these guys that are making pacts with Satan. We pray against the enemy. you would safeguard them, and that you would, you would vindicate their faith to their believing. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for the sermon that you gave us. 
king of heaven. Will you stand with me?